Okay, and, and now um, I'd like to welcome our second speaker, uh, Professor E.W. Bert Meyer. Uh, Bert has been responsible for several important breakthroughs in the discovery and development of supramolecular polymers and materials to create functional and adaptive molecular systems. He's a distinguished university professor of organic chemistry at the Institute for Complex Molecular Systems of the Eindhoven University of Technology in the Netherlands. After receiving his PhD in organic chemistry at the University of Groningen in 1982, he worked for 10 years in industry. He was appointed to Eindhoven in 1991, where he went on to found the Institute for Complex Molecular Systems and co-found two companies. He also holds part-time positions in Nijmegen and Santa Barbara and at the Max Planck Institute in Mainz. Today, Professor Meyer is a member of several editorial advisory boards, including JAX, the Journal of the American Chemical Society. He's published over 600 peer-reviewed papers and trained more than 90 graduate students. His work has been recognized with the Spinoza Award, the ACS Award for Polymer Chemistry, the ACS Cope Scholar Award, the Prelog Medal, the Nagoya Gold Medal, the Alexander von Humboldt Research Award, and the Chirality Medal. He's a member of many academies for scientific excellence, including the Royal Netherlands Academy of Science. In 2020, this is impressive, making me jealous, he was knighted by the king to become a commander of the Order of the Netherlands Lion. That's a heck of a title, Bert. He's a great friend of Northwestern. We're really happy to have him back. Please join me in welcoming Professor Meyer to the IAN Symposium. Thank you very much, uh, Chad. Uh, it's a real honor for me to uh, be here to, today in this fantastic symposium. And I hope you can see my uh, first slide uh, in the meantime. Um, it's a pity that I can't come to Chicago. I would love to come to Everston and to meet all of your students and staff members and friends. But I do it here from, from the Netherlands in, with a lot of COVID-19 restrictions. But anyhow, it's a pleasure to tell you about some new results and, and some philosophy about functional supramolecular systems and, and materials. And being a chemist, I'm actually a synthetic chemist, and I see synthesis as the strength of chemistry due to the fact that you, for 150 years of progress in synthetic chemistry, we can live with so many people on earth for all kinds of uh, developments. You could actually say that due to all of this, every molecule that can exist on earth can be synthesized in the laboratory. Obviously, it can be done better, easier, economically feasible, but in the end, it is feasible. So what is then the next step, especially if a chemist sees that the molecules are actually his or her? And now what you see that is that many disciplines go into the molecular way as well, molecular neurology, molecular biology, molecular materials. And, and what do we actually see here? We see that the uh, instrumentation that is available to zoom in to the molecular level has gotten to a degree that is almost unbelievable 20 years ago. And as a result, we know that if we change the molecule, we could change the function. And that's the reason that people are interested to do the molecular way. However, if you look to this, you could say a molecule doesn't have a function. A molecule only has a structure and a property. The function comes when these R molecules are working together in a system. So if you take this and you take the strength of chemistry, you would say what we have to do, we have to synthesize these systems, not only the molecule, but also the whole uh, system they have to do. Now, obviously, that's uh, not a, a new field. Here you see some examples from people who assemble molecules together and particles all at the nanometer level. It's beautiful structures, and we move slowly into the area in which we can use the functions of these architectures. And what I'd like to do today is to take with you some of the ideas how to use these supramolecular concepts in bringing molecules together, go to molecular systems and materials. I will do that with uh, two main topics and one at the end in adaptive materials, tell you a little bit about 
our adventure in supramolecular polymers, then go to highly ordered discrete oligomers, they're all acting at a nanometer level, and at the end, end with some adaptive uh, materials. So starting with supramolecular polymers, as we know, there are nanoscopic structures in nature, actually, I think fifth, uh, one fifth of the proteins assemble into long one dimensional arrays for all kinds of, uh, of functions. They're there since the beginning of life on earth. For long, people were also looking to how molecules would assemble, but at a certain moment, it became clear that polymers were macromolecules. However, always at certain places, people were trying to make molecules bring it together into one dimensional arrays, but never up to the level that they would give you properties similar to macromolecules until I think uh, many years ago, we, we did this discovery of having a very simple molecule what uh, is self with self complementary, as you see here, the crystal structure, and here you see the chemical structure that has a very high association constant, so it's actually always bound. And if you have a space with two of these groups, you make a supramolecular polymer, and that as a material behaves actually like a plastic. It has the same properties as room temperatures of every normal macromolecule, however, it is small molecules. And I think. It is a great opportunity to see how the plastic soup could be done by materials that have much more supramolecular interactions than covalent, than covalent bonds. To give you an update on where we are, we are actually looking in order, together with companies, to bring it into uh, human beings. Supramolecular biomaterials are unique materials in order to tune the biocompatibility, biodegradability on one hand, and the uh, mechanical properties on the other. And we're very proud that clinical trials are ongoing in order to engineer vascular graphs. And you see in the cartoon it over here, what, what is done, you take a graph made out of an electrospin polymer, supramolecular polymer, that is a mesh, you bring it next to the heart, then the cells come in, they go into the mesh holes, and at a certain moment, they take over the function of the, bi the biomaterial. The biomaterial disintegrates and the cells take over. And you have a new blood vessel. And this actually goes extremely well due to the supramolecular interactions that are in that type of material. So this is a nanoscopic material into the, into the body. We're now very heavily involved in order to make an art artificial extracellular matrix. That is, in order to get a substitute for matrigel, which is used for all kinds of studies with cells. Actually, it's, I think, a three to four billion dollar uh, business. But it's very dangerous to use that when you're interested in using uh, these cells at the end in, in human beings. And it's attractive to go to there in order to, to make it. However, it's not so easy. And uh, that came out of our, our studies, and we're not the only one. Many groups around the world are trying to come up with a synthetic hydrogel that could really replace matrigel. So since it was so difficult, we started to go more back to the fundamentals. And at a certain moment, we, we created a very simple amphiphilic molecule that you see over here. It is a, a C3 symmetrical molecule. It's a surfactant because it is hydrophobic here, hydrophilic over there, but the hydrophobicity is just enough to shield these amides by which they can make hydrogen bonds in aqueous solution. So in a way, it's a combination of a, a cylindrical micelle, but inside the cylindrical micelle, we have triple hydrogen bond functions. And what you see here is the cartoon, and what you see here is a cryo-TM picture as has been done by Janus Lehner and, and Matt Baker. Now, the beauty of supramolecular polymers is that you can make very easily copolymers that you see over here. You can very easily modify this structure with, let's say, have ammonium salts and a dye, or have ammonium salts and another dye, alcohol groups or just ammonium groups. And if you bring them together, they mix and make a random copolymer. But still, it's dynamic, and I will show you in a minute what the dynamicity would, would mean. By having dyes, you can beautifully use uh, fluorescent microscopy to see further whether you understand whether the molecules go into fibers. 
And for that, if you take a normal picture, you could say like this is fluorescent microscope. Maybe that are fibers and something is more, more difficult. But Lorenzo Albertazzi in the, in the group uh, started to use super resolution microscopy, actually storm. And by doing so, you can go to really beautiful dimensions and you hopefully you see that there's all one dimensional structures out of small molecules in a stable form. And the exchange rate is in the question of hours to days by which the molecules can uh, exchange. So taking that into account, we were interested in order to go to more biological functions. And for that, we uh, started to see whether we could make a supramolecular polymer as a copolymer having a unit, and that is here a boronic acid, that should bind with sialic acid that is on the surface of a cell. For that, obviously, you have to study first whether these molecules really go into a copolymer, and that's what Julia and Bastaval uh, did. And what you can see, this molecule I showed you in, in the beginning that gives beautiful stacks, and everything that we do optically or with scattering techniques will show that this type of molecule really intercalates into, this, into the fiber and forms a random copolymer as long as you don't go beyond 25%. And typically we're going to 10% of that functionality, which is then randomly oriented. But what does it actually mean, randomly oriented? We see this type of fibers as a kind of one dimensional cell membrane, by which not by just swimming the molecules through the cell membrane, but going in and out from one place to the other, you can reshuffle the functionality. And that's what uh, we have uh, done. Here you see human red blood cells. Actually, this is the microscope uh, pictures. We take the structure and then we look on how many of these boronic acids we need to form a binding with sialic acid. We add to that a dye so that we can visualize the uh, fibers. Here you see the cartoon, what you hopefully see in this fluorescent microscope picture over here, or even more better here. And what you now see, this is the cell. This is a supralamachia polymer. And what we see that it really goes in patches. Patches here, patches there. And if you look to the movie, you see that certain parts of the fiber are really connected to the cell, while the other part is still moving around freely. And it is our proposition that due to the cell and its specific position of sialic acid, will recruit those parts of the supramolecular polymer to bind strongly. And that would be the ideal multivalence, multivalency behavior, similar as in nature, the two fragments are coming together. And, and to, to see it over here, here you see a graph on the, on the bottom. This is how many of the functional unit we have to do to the polymer. If there's nothing in, it doesn't bind. But then we go to 5% and is up the best possible way to bind. And if you add more to this, the, the cell gets a problem to figure out how to deal with all of these functionalities uh, in. In order to show that it is really a multivalency effect, you see here how much free sialic acid we have to add to this uh, cell um, uh, supramolecular polymer area in order to remove the fiber against from the uh, structure. There's 10 to the power of three to four times more sialic acid free as sialic on the supramolecular polymer that brings this, uh, breaks up this type of uh, interaction. For us, it's a very appealing way on using this type of methodology now in order to go to the artificial uh, extracellular matrix. The, for long, we uh, published about this molecule and we had uh, this type of cartoon to it. But if you very closely look to, to this uh, cryo TM, and especially there where you see this red part, it looks a little bit strange. And we studied now for five years the structure of this, and that's done by Janus, Met, Rene, and Sandra Schumacher in collaboration with the University of Berlin. And uh, I will show you the, the results. Uh, we use cryo-TM tomography to go into more detail. 
This is a very uh, difficult slide to follow, but it gives the idea that it is not something that, that is changing a single chain, but it looks like that there are two chains together. Then together with the people in Berlin, we did a 3D reconstruction of hundreds of these fibers. And if you do so, there's no other conclusion that what you get is a double helix based on individual molecules that really go as a two-day structure. In the beginning, we had really trouble to understand why that is, but I think it's a hydrophobic, hydrophilic type of uh, a balance that makes it into a bilayer. And in a way, it even now looks more on a kind of artificial 1D cell, uh, cell membrane. And since it has now that pitch, you can use the pitch by looking to the composition of a copolymer. This is the molecule I just showed you, just a simple thing. It has a pitch length of 90.9, the helix. And then if we mix them with this molecule here on the top, or with this one at the, at the bottom, you will look to what you get out of the cryo TM, and you can follow if you go from here to here, that the pitch lengths become shorter. In the other case, the pitch length becomes longer, even if this one gives you two without actually any pitch. We can't find a, find a pitch. So we now have a technique that cryo TM that really gives us indeed great detail about how these self-assembled molecules go into a one-dimensional array. Now, many of you would say, so, so what's, what's new? I mean, uh, uh, the Nobel Prize was given to cryo TM. They go to the atomic level for looking to proteins, but it is all done to structures that have a very discrete morphology and a very discrete structure. What we do here is a supramolecular arrangement that is dynamic and very difficult to say that it is one dimensional crystal. And therefore, I think it's a really a next step in the understanding of assembly molecules that are very dynamic to get a very good detail about this type of structure. And we're very proud that it is just published in, in JAX and it will get a nice front cover in two weeks from, from now. So that about some new results on supramolecular polymerization and uh, through the years, we came to the conclusion that there are many, many, many supramolecular polymers now. And if you want to characterize them, there are actually two types of mechanisms. One is the isodesmic, meaning that the association constant is independent on the chain length. And you have the nucleated, elongated type of structures that starts with the nucleus and then grows. And for people that are in the polymer really in the polymer chemistry, you could say one is step, the other one is a chain type of uh, polymerization. We were very happy to find out that these two you have and the ordered structures are always nucleated elongators. But then it became more complicated because we came to the conclusion that if you have that nucleated state, like in crystallization of small molecules, that you have multiple pathways. You have a kinetic off pathway, and you have a thermodynamic on pathway, a more stable aggregate. And this beautifully shown on this molecule that's done by Peter Korova and Tom de Greef. They go into helical structures. They prefer one helicity due to stereocenters in the molecule. However, it starts to form the p-helix and the p-helix dissociates again back to make a new nucleus on this way and you end up with the M helical structure. And this also now makes a lot of sense that you have to be very careful by using the pathway to go to a material. And I will come back to that later. What I hope at the end that you come to the conclusion that this type of work is not just self-assembly, but it should be a non-covalent synthesis to find the right to find the right structure. But today, I'd like to share with you uh, some very recent results where I get very excited uh, uh, about that hasn't been published, but it's just uh, accepted. And uh, that is the role of solvents. If we self-assemble in solvents, we typically look to the solute-solute interactions to make molecules or polymers. However, the interactions between the solutes 
is a little bit similar to the interaction of the solute with the solvent. So the solvent has a, a very strong uh, influence on the way how things assemble into structures. And in the past, we already looked to the potential enthalpy energy of water in oils. In other words, if you polymerize a structure in dry methyl cyclohexane, it gives another structure than when you have PPMs amounts of water in. But today, I'd like to show you another uh, example in which my hobby, chirality in stereochemistry, plays an important, uh, important role. And uh, for those who, who want to learn more uh, about it, we just actually today uh, published a, a perspective uh, in, in science on this, uh, on this issue. I'd like to come back to uh, two famous people, uh, Pasteur and Van Hoff. We all know Pasteur's famous experiment about the sodium ammonium tartrate, isn't it? He crystallizes at room temperature, you get a conglomerate that gives you the, let's say, P and M helical crystals. But if he did it at 30 degrees, he got the racemate. And only at 20 degrees, he could separate the crystals of one size and of the, of the other. And you can't do that when it's crystallized at 30 degrees. Later, it found, they found out that the Pasteur salt had four molecules of water in the crystal structure, while the racemic compound has only one molecule of water into the crystal. Meaning that water, the solvent at which you crystallize it out, determines actually the morphology of the, of the structure. This, this, this was, was known. Then Machin, in our group synthesized the uh, three molecules that are lookalikes. Let's start in the middle, the uh, triphenylene. It has an amide functionality in alkyl side chain. This molecule was stacked on top of each other by triple hydrogen bonding interactions, some pi pi stacking, and the tails will take care of that it is soluble in uh, organic solvents, especially apolar organic solvents. It will form a helix, but the obviously the a card will give you equal amounts of P and M helix. Then he synthesized the S and he synthesized the R with the idea that the S would go in one helical form and the R will go in the other helical form. He synthesized them and then he studied them in a uh, uh, glorinated uh, solvent and exactly what you expect. The A card doesn't give you a CD spectrum, so there's no difference in absorptions with the left and right circle polarized light. But if you take the R or the S, you get a mirror image CD spectrum fully in accordance with what you would expect. And this is a supramolecular chirality. It's not just due to the stereo center, but it's really the packing into a helix due to a short shift of the, of the amides. And this is an exciton coupled CD. Now, if you heat such a sample at a certain temperature, let's say at 100 degrees, then it disassembles and the CD is gone. If you then cool again, the CD spectrum comes back. And the same you could do with UV spectroscopy. At high degrees, you see that's a molecular dissolved molecule. And at 20 degrees, it's a supramolecular polymer. And what we then typically do, we go and sit on this peak in the circuit diagonalism spectrum at high temperatures, that is zero, and we cool very slowly. And here we see the nucleation of the supramolecular polymerization, and then it starts to grow, and here you have the polymer formed. Everything in line with uh, what a lot of people in the world do, and we didn't have any surprises. Then we took the achiral molecule with a chiral solvent, and then what you see, that is without specific interactions, this chiral solvent makes that achiral molecule in one helical form only. Actually, the optical activity at room temperature is exactly the same as of the chiral molecule. So the role of the solvent is as strong as a stereocenter in the molecule. And then Machin decided to also dissolve a chiral molecule in a chiral solvent. And to be honest, I have to say that uh, I didn't know why he did it, because why should you do this? And he saw a very strange effect. He suddenly saw that it flipped helicity. And we thought, well, what's, what's ongoing here? Is there a competition between the stereocenter in the solvent and the stereocenter 
in the molecule, how does that behave? And then we found a very old letter of Franz Hoff, the hero of Dutch chemist, to Meyerhofer in 1893, where he said the solubility of enantiomers in a chiral solvent could possibly be different. This has been in the air very long. It is never actually used in uh, any practical application because somewhere you couldn't see it. Some crystallization worked, but that is about it. And I think we now know why. And it's a complicated slide, but I will bring you uh, through. What we've done here, we took a chiral solvent and we compared the chiral solvent in one enantiomer versus chiral solvent in the other enantiomer. And then we looked to the data as a function of concentration with the, the real experimental data, and we simulated it with a model that I will not go into to explain. At first instance, they look mirror images. But if you carefully look to it, then you see for the R, the temperature at which it goes from one helical form to the other is at 60 degrees, while here is at 75 degrees. And if you then take all of the data together, you will see that on the enthalpy and entropy, there's hardly any diastereomic relationship. The real reason comes from the role of the solvent. So it's the solvent that makes a difference between the R and the S. And what you now see that is that the effect is small, but due to the fact that you have a corporate supramolecular structure that goes into hundreds of nanometers in length with the corporativity, it's large enough to see, the, to see the differences. But it also shows that it's how important it is to not only look to the uh, assembly of molecules and take the solvent as something that is just a solvent to dissolve the tails, it is really part of the assembly, which makes that if you analyze supramolecular aggregates in solvents, it's very difficult to say what you're actually looking at. Are you looking to an ordered form of solvents around it, like what people say with water around the protein, or is it just the molecule that you're looking at? I think we have to do a lot in the future to, uh, to, to, go, to, uh, to go to this. And with that, I come to a point, is it all nice to look to these structures of chirality, or can we also use uh, the chirality? And that's what I like to do with uh, uh, a technique that uh, is uh, coming from Ronama. Uh, we were working with chiral molecules for years, and he approached us because he invented the chirally induced spin selectivity effect, meaning that what you have is that the, uh, if you have a helix and you tunnel electrons through, depending on the helicity, there's a preference of spin up or spin down. And it would be great to use that, for instance, for water splitting. First, it would be great to show that it, you can do spin controlled uh, chemistry. We did that with a porphyrin, a zinc porphyrin you see over here with amides, and it has tails to make it soluble, it's stereocenters to make it chiral. We can control the monomer, the polymer. We did it uh, together with the Yashima's group and Nagoya microscopy. You see the helix here, and this is a kind of cartoon on what we think what it is. We look how we can make the polymer forms that goes by nucleation elongation growth, so we have everything under control. Then with these chiral structures, as well as with the uh, achiral structures, we went to Israel to measure together with Onama IV curves on these chiral aggregates and on the achiral porphyrins. And what you see here, so this is the setup, it's a, it's a uh, you, you measure conductivity through this device with a magnetic field in one direction or in the other direction. And then you look to the differences. And with the chiral porphyrins, you see there's a difference between magnetic field or down. While with the achiral porphyrin, it is the same in both cases. Now, the achiral porphyrin gives you equal amounts of P and M helis, while the chiral only gives you one type. That means that this cartoon is actually incorrect. You look to a bundle of, uh, of fibers. I was happy with it, but I was not very convinced because the effects are small and I didn't know exactly how that tunneling would go. So we started to work on water splitting. And although we're still not completely sure how it all goes, 
the most remarkable part is that we always get more hydrogen produced and we also get more current when we use the chiral structures on the surface instead of having an achiral structure. So that looks like that that spin effect really works. But then the breakthrough came by measuring hydrogen peroxide. And hydrogen peroxide seems to be a side product in the water splitting to oxygen and hydrogen. And every time that we use bare titanium dioxide or an achiral structure, what we see is that we get hydrogen peroxide formed. Well, if we use the chiral zinc porphyrin or any other structure that we measured in the meantime, it doesn't give you hydrogen peroxide. And there I'm very excited about because that could give you the following cartoon. The proposal is that if you have a racemic semiconductor and you tunnel through electrons, you make OH radicals of spin up and spin down. That gives you the possibility to make a singlet pair making hydrogen peroxide. However, if you have a homochiral organic semiconductor, you only make OH radicals with spin up or spin down. And as a result, it is impossible to make hydrogen peroxide, meaning that the OH radical reacts further to hydrogen and oxygen. This needs obviously much more uh, work to do and certainly to make these uh, uh, substrates more stable. But on the other hand, we wanna increase that uh, selectivity of the spins. That's done by Shigamba Okani, together with Ron Naaman's group. He synthesized this molecule. Uh, by system emits chirality in it. It has stereocenters. And if you do it right, it goes into one helical form. Then you make a spin, you, you spin code a film and you take it AFM and you see bundles of these structures with different heights that you see over here. Then with a and magnetic field uh, AFM, you do the following. With a magnet, you polymerize, uh, polarize the spins in the nickel, paralactic, you have gold, the spins go through, and then you measure the IV curve. And then you do it for the spins up and down. And much to our surprise, the selectivity is 84%. And for chemists, I think you can compare it a little bit to enantiomeric excess. So there's a big preference for one spin going over the other. Now you could argue, do, do, do you do that right? And therefore, this molecule has the beauty that if you assemble them at minus 10, it gives you the opposite chirality. So the same molecule, assembled at 20 degrees, give you the P helix. If you do it at minus 10, it gives the M helix. It's diastereomeric, so the CDs are not mirror images. But if you now do that IV curves, I hope you can appreciate that if we take the P helix, the big one is magnetic field up. And if we do for the M helix, it is the magnetic field down that is the, the highest. So with the same molecule, but different chirality, you get this type of, uh, this type of structure. So we're very excited about it, and I hope we can now go to structures that are really stable to do spin-controlled uh, chemistry. With that, I stop with the supramolecular polymers and, and, their, uh, and their possibilities, and I like to uh, take the last part to go to the next, but not before saying that many people around the world are doing beautiful work on supramolecular polymers, and just mentioned here Sam Stoop and Takusa Hida's work that I appreciate very much. So the final part, which I'd like to call macroorganic chemistry, is to bring organic chemistry and polymer chemistry together. Organic chemistry gives you the beauty of making all kinds of complicated molecules, and the polymers give you the, the possibility to make materials. And how can we combine these two? And we are going to do that with discrete oligomers. And we think it's a possible route to molecular nanotechnology. Let me tell you how we started into, into it. It's really a nanotech issue. Maybe you know that ASML is a company close to Eindhoven that makes, uh, I think, 95% of the wafer steppers for uh, integrated circuits, and they can go to dimensions in the order of seven nanometers. But Intel likes to have a hole that is only a few nanometers going from one layer to the other. And then that um, 
directed self-assembly could do a job. So what Louis Pitet did, he synthesized a block copolymer of dimethylsiloxanes and lactic acid, having a very high chi value. He made them small with a low dispersity, and it follows all of the block copolymer uh, work, lamellar, cylinders, and spheres. And then we take the one with cylinders and we put them into holes of, um, um, on a surface. And uh, the hole here is about 50 nanometers. And what you see that every hole has a different thing. It was a little bit surprised because it was the best possible polymer that you could make. Then we did a calculation. And what turns out in such a hole, you only have 8,000 8, molecules. The molar mass distribution is 1.08. The fluctuation in composition is two to four percent, and as a result, there's not a single hole that has the same composition of molecules. And as we know from work from Craig Hawke and, and Ed Kramer, that especially in confined space, it is very sensitive to the composition. So what we then decided to do to synthesize precise block molecules, and here you see the longest one we we made is lactic acid, is racemic. And this is dimethylsiloxane. Much to our surprise, everyone has dimethylsiloxanes at home, but no one really made these discrete oligomers longer than about six or eight. And here you see that it's now the dispersity is 1.0000 something to do. And if you now fill these holes, you will, I hope you appreciate that the regularity is much higher here than it was in the previous. Case. And it was work from Bas van Genebeek and Bas de Waal, who synthesized these, uh, these molecules. So now we have them, uh, the, the siloxanes, and we try to use it now as a discrete material-like, solvent-like fragment. And it gives a lot of interesting possibilities, we think, because somewhere the molecules we make are in between a block of polymer or a block molecule of liquid crystal. I'd like to show you the example. This is a supramolecular polymer with siloxanes of different length. They act like a block of polymer. This part doesn't like to be dissolved in this part, and then the ratio between the two determines whether it's a lemma or a cylinder or whatever. However, the precursor of this unit crystallizes in 2D. And here you see a cartoon, and here you see the uh, reflections on X-ray. And now that the length of this spacer only determines how, how the, the, the distance between these layers. So this looks like a smectic like of liquid crystal, while it is actually still a normal material. And this work, especially by Helen, Helen Zah. Now, Brigitte showed that it really gives you perfect type of materials, is siloxane and is hydrozones. And I hope you, you can appreciate that that material has, a, has a, a melting point that is so sharp, you can make domains as large as centimeters in which all of the cylinders are perfectly aligned with respect to each other, almost like a crystal, but it, it remains a polymeric uh, material. Very recently, Martin Fanson synthesized one with diphenyl entosine. And with this, in depending siloxane, again, you make lamella 2D structures that are perfectly uh, aligned. And we thought this would be great to use for triplet-triplet annihilation experiments in which you add a sensitizer in 0.1% to it, you irradiate this, the excitation goes to the acceptor, which is then the diphenyl entosine, and two triplets go to a higher, higher laying um, energy state and the luminescence comes, comes out. This is a technique used by many, many people. Well, we like to do that in a polymer material and more or less as a single crystal. And here you see some of the results. If you have it amorphous, you get that up conversion light, but it's very low. If you have it ordered, it's much higher. You can see that over here on the left uh, side. If we irradiate through 50, we get this normal fluorescence, but now we do 532, you get the same fluorescence. And this is that upconverted light, and this is low energy, you get higher energy out. But what is more important 
if you dip, disperse the sensitizer well, it actually goes much better. And we can make now centimeter long uh, white uh, uh, areas in which it is perfectly dispersed and perfectly aligned. And with that, together with the group of Jaime Jose Rivas, we're even able to make linear polarized emission with coming in with non-polarized light. So this is due to the perfect alignment of these uh, of these structures. So I think it gives it a possibility to use it as a as a material. The same question that I asked here, you can ask about this molecule. This is a siloxane, it's a tail, and this is an azobenzene. Aso the difference between these two molecules is just a methoxy over an OH. You would say, what's the difference? It's just a small difference. The OH can do hydrogen bonding, it makes it into a supramolecular polymer, if you like, due to this hydrogen-hydrogen bond interaction, and it acts like a block of polymer. This one can't, and it crystallizes. And as you see over here, this is the crystal yellow, this is a trans azobenzene. But if you shine light on this of 365, it goes to cis, the order is gone. If you now take 455, what it happens it is it goes back to the trans, and as a result, it uh, as a result, the um, goes back to the trans, and that goes so fast that you can't actually measure how fast it goes. Normally it takes time, but it not only goes back to the trans, it also goes back to crystallization. I showed you before that in these phase separated states, the crystallization is so fast that you actually can't follow how fast this goes. So in a result, we have a material which is a paste. If you irradiate with 365, it becomes uh, azobenzenes inside of siloxane, so it becomes a lubricant. If you don't shine light on it for 455, it goes back to a paste. And I'll hope that I can show you in this, uh, in, in, in here. You see two glass plates with something where you can see where it is and some weight connected to it. And we have glued them together with this uh, paste. And we shine light on it and now the laser will come, light source 365, and you see it becomes a lubricant. We say, oh, stop because now it's back here. And if we shine light on it again, it falls off. So really it's, it's almost instantaneously uh, going from um, crystal to an amorphous back to a, a crystal. And that is due to the incredibly high chi parameter. So insolubility between the two units. And as a result, the crystallization goes extremely uh, fast. Now we're excited about all kinds of uh, 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 adaptivity, and I like to end with uh, with one example that is a different story, but I just want to show you uh, because uh, I'm here sitting in the Netherlands, and the Netherlands are very well known for uh, windmills, four blade windmills. I hope you all realize this. And uh, when Ben Feringa, my friend, got the Nobel Prize, we thought we have to make something for him. And here you see a light mill, a four blade light mill. It's the same idea, highly oriented molecules, but now a molecule that goes from cis to trans, in which the going back from cis to trans goes so fast that the molecule starts to oscillate. And as a result, we can make such a uh, light mill. But if you want to hear more about this, then I really have to come next year. And for those interested, I can tell you more about this type of work. So what I hope that I've done is uh, that uh, I showed you that we can go from molecules to supramolecular assemblies, uh, that uh, we like to go to lifelike systems and we have to see how far we can push the uh, assembly process. What? Okay, I will, uh, I'm almost done. Uh, functional lifelike supramolecular system, why? And what have we do we have to do? I think we have to get architecture integrity at different length scales. Dynamic adaptivity of different time scales. We have to go out of control, out of equilibrium. So kinetic control. It means non-homogeneous distribution of components and many more like buffling and outer regulation. And by doing this, we go to new technologies by mastering this complexity. And wouldn't it be great if we could really make an artificial exocellular matrix? 
or having devices in which not only the, mo the molecule has its atoms correctly arranged, but also all of the atoms in the device, or making something that goes into the body that's almost look like a natural system. So nature is certainly a source of uh, inspiration. But I'd like to come back to that word chemist. And chemists have made covalent synthesis to incredible progress. We can make vitamin 12 in 72 steps. And therefore, we propose a paradigm shift in synthetic chemistry and not talk anymore about self-assembly, but go to non-covalent synthesis. It's impossible to get structures like this by just mixing all of the components together. We have to come with ways in which go beyond a one-step assembly process, and we have to go to multi-step. And for that, it's very important to know all of the details from a physical organic point of view about the one-step reactions. Otherwise, we can never go into this. And if we don't make this step, we will end up by making more and more of structure that are made by self-assembly, and we will never make the step in which these artificial systems really can work together with biological systems in a variety of applications, because you want to use the dynamics of the supramolecular arrangements, but at the same time, the rigidity that is needed in order to do, to do the work. So I hope that this will be a topic uh, in which a lot of young people will, will step in. Before I end, I'd like to thank the people who uh, did the, the work. I think I mentioned the names of all of the people who did it. It's a picture of the group before COVID-19. I'd like to thank my collaborators, Anja Palmas and Guilherme Fanton, and obviously all of the others that I mentioned and those who gave the, the money. But last but not least, I'd like to thank you for inviting me uh, to this exciting symposium and uh, I hope uh, you enjoyed at least parts of what I had to discuss. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Bert. That was uh, absolutely fantastic. Um, so we'll now take questions from the audience. As a reminder, for those of you with video and audio access who would like to ask a question, please activate your video and unmute your audio to make us aware that you have a question. Otherwise, please keep your video and audio disabled. For those of you without video and audio access, please type your question in the Q&A tab found at the bottom of your screen. First questions. Oops, hold on, I gotta open up the tab here. Chad, um, Nathan Janeski here. Hi, hi Bert. Um, I have a question just to head us off. I thought Sam was gonna go, but I'll cut in. Um, uh, you mentioned early on in your talk uh, some, some really nice copolymers and just awesome uh, cryo TEM reconstructions of those uh, copolymers. And it immediately, immediately made me think of um, whether you've been able to access block copolymers through sort of a driven phase separation process or whether dynamics are ultimately your enemy there um, or perhaps your friend in, in equilibrating into some sort of phase separated block copolymer version of the supramolecular particles, uh, uh, polymers, sorry. And if 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 you've been able to do that, you know, we're looking at more and more, uh, trying to look at dynamics at high resolution by electron microscopy in liquids in, in solution. And uh, wondering if you've thought about those kinds of experiments in aiding you to sort of design systems and, and think about characterization. Yeah, uh, I think it's a great, great question. Uh, I could make a lecture all of only on this topic, but if you take uh, two monomers for a polymer and we take one as the, let's say the homopolymer and we take the other then it can have different roles. It can be a co-monomer, in which you get a random copolymer. It can be an intercalator. That means it can only go in between the two of the main polymer, and you can't have two next to each, next to each other. It can be an end capper, but which only can act to the ends of the polymer because it doesn't like to have anything on the other side. And finally, it can be a, a sequesterer, that means it takes out monomers from your polymer. So you have four possible roles of a co-monomer. And that depends that if you, if you take one that uh, is um, one that is an intercalator and it can only have the same types to it, 
then you want to minimize the number of AB contacts, and then you make a block or polymer under thermodynamic control. So you continuously have to also simulate the interactions between, let's say, A with A, A with B, B with B, but then also ABA, ABB, and so on and so forth. And if you do the simulation, you can go to random copolymers, block copolymers, end cap polymers, or sequestered uh, polymers. And especially the last ones give you very strange and unexpected results. But, uh, and, and yes, uh, it, it is possible to see that with uh, cryo TM. For us, we focus now more on length than on block, block copolymers. Uh, especially since they are so difficult to make under thermic dynamic control. The ones that are all made are kinetically controlled. And that means that if you keep them for a certain period, then they disassemble and they assemble again to random copolymer because it's a kinetically controlled right, right. polymerization. That you don't see in the, into the literature because you sh everyone shows the block copolymers after kinetic control way, right. uh, but at the end they, they reshuffle. Right, of course, yeah. Have you just to follow up quickly? Have you uh, tried to stitch them together at that point to trap the uh, kinetic product? I mean, covalently. Uh, we're working on it. Very okay. complicated. Awesome. Very yeah. Complicated. Thank you. Okay. Uh, hello, Bert. Hi, Sam. Uh, this was a fantastic talk. Uh, congratulations. Um, I wish you would have been here in person. If if uh, you would have been here. We would have had a big party for you here in Chicago, uh, for you and for all the distinguished uh, speakers we have today. So maybe next year. Yeah. Anyway, I have uh, a couple of questions. Uh, the uh, first one is, I want to take you back to the first part of your talk. Uh, I'm very intrigued by why uh, go, taking the boronic acid to you know concentrations higher than 15, 20 mole percent uh, why the binding doesn't work. And, and I guess what's intriguing to me here, and, and this is very important for the bioactivity of supramolecular polymers, uh, that it is, that would it be the result of entropy, right? Because you have a dynamic system. And so uh, basically when you have too much boronic acid, then the you know, entropy basically repels the structure from the cell. Uh, but uh, at lower contents of boronic acid, you know, the internal dynamics of the supramolecular polymer can operate. And so the system is very rich in entropy at that point. And so I'm just wondering if, if you have had any thoughts on the, the theoretical explanation uh, of that. I, I have a second question, but maybe you want to take this one first. I think this is a very important point that we discussed over and over before we published the, <clears throat> sorry, the, the paper. Because you don't expect it at forehand that it wouldn't go. Right. I have to say, we don't know whether or not due to all of these clustering together, the polymer breaks. Because you should realize that if you put too many of the boronic acids in, that your polymer falls apart. And so what the cell could do is bring too many together and therefore it breaks. But also your argument could equally well the case. I think there are two reported papers in which they say the same about that. If the number is too high, it doesn't work anymore. Right. Yes. Anyway, yeah, that's an in interesting yeah. point. The second question is, in your last, the last part of your talk, uh, that's you know really fascinating. Uh, the two-dimensional crystals that you describe. So you know your constructs with the well-defined oligomers. Uh, are very reminiscent of the natural crystals that high molecular weight polymers form. You know, they're the crystals of the lamellar crystals of, of high molecular weight polymers. And so I'm wondering if, it, you know, what you think, this is a, a question for you to think about. Uh, it should be possible then in principle, if we could figure out a way to do a two-step, you know, a supramolecular uh, uh, polymerization and, and, and then a high molecular weight polymer in the next step, that it might be possible to see some of these behaviors that you are discovering in high molecular weight polymers, but they have, 
they they start their journey to that structure though in supramolecular chemistry and yeah. as supramolecular polymers and and then you would be able to exploit all the good things about high molecular weight which yeah. uh, would be a wonderful world you know of you know not not combining organic chemistry and polymer chemistry but combining supramolecular chemistry with polymer chemistry yeah i first have to say that as uh, so when the oligomers are short let's say up to about a hundred or so uh, uh, monomer units, then there is a strict difference between what the polymer chemists call monodisperse and what we call discrete. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you go to, let's say 10,000, 15,000, then the differences are actually uh, are not there anymore. They just fade away. Yes. So if you're interested in really nanoscopic dimensions, and that's what we are, we are interested in dynamic by which actually if you look to these layers they're so close by that they're still separated but close enough by to have some cooperative action to it that's what we already see that it looks like a front of crystallization that it starts here but it takes the layers above with it because they're connected by a perfect spacer but you're right uh if you want to go to block copolymers of longer length and then go to supramolecular interaction, you will probably get the same, mm -hmm. uh, but the dimensions are much uh, larger. Yeah, thank you. Okay, two quick questions from the uh, audience. Uh, this is from Anish, who says, really cool talk regarding solvent-induced chirality. Does the supramolecular polymer retain its chirality in the absence of solvent molecules? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Uh, the uh, That's true. Uh, we. Uh, if we use a chiral solvent with a glor so a chlorinated solvent, then there's enough dynamic to go only to one helicity. If we do that, and then we replace that solvent to, for us, a decalin, there the molecule is stable for month, and it doesn't disassemble, and hence the uh, it remains uh, uh, chiral. You have to realize that it is a kinetic trap because at the end it wants to be racemic. But as we talk. We're doing experiments in Israel in which we have an achiral molecule. We make them supramolecularly preferred helicity. We make it on the thin film. We remove all of the solvents and we do the spin selection and we can actually use the solvent to imprint the chirality in the material and then measure the, the spin selectivity in the, I say in the device. So yeah, the, the answer is yes. Uh, I think it's an important, uh, uh, aspect because you you can even think about tiny amounts of chiral impurities that could give you uh, overall chirality and that adds then to the question how chirality on earth started. Okay, great uh, and here you have a fan in India where it must be about 11 uh, p.m. or approaching mid midnight. It's from Javed from uh, Pune, India. An inspiring talk as always. I want to ask about your supermolecular polymer you mentioned to be used for vascular regeneration. What makes the cells adhere to such supermolecular systems? And then how does the system break, letting the cells grow? So the, uh, I don't know exactly how the cells adhere to the, to the material. It is a mesh by electrospinning and the mesh size is such that the cells can go in. And I think what, what happens that is that actually during the cells go in, they make their own extracellular matrix and that gets in contact with the material. The material in a cell uh, is uh, oxidized. So it's an oxidative degradation of the, of the material. And uh, so it disappears. And since it is not really a, a macromolecule, but there are small molecules, that uh, removal is more easy than if you have a macromolecule that you really have to cut in small pieces. But it's a complicated thing because sometimes certain parts of the polymer are encapsulated by extracellular matrix and then it stays in longer. So it's really uh, an important issue to find out where it really ends. But since it's totally biocompatible and non-toxic, you could also argue how important is it that all of the material disappears, but at the end, it behaves like um, a normal um, blood vessel and that company is actually now making heart valves for young children so that the heart valve grows with the growth of the children. 
Great. But that's not our work. That's from a company called Celtis, where I'm not involved in. So I'm, I, I don't have, uh, what is it? Uh, financial benefits from it. So how do you call that in the US? Conflict of interest. Conflict of interest, yeah. Um, okay, so um, we'll take one last one. You, you've got a, a lot of questions that we'll send you to answer to the yeah. audience. Sure. This is from Ben Partridge. Great talk, thank you. For the BTA structures characterized by cryo-TM, what is the driving force for forming specifically double helices rather than triple helices or higher order bundles? Yeah, very, very good. Uh, obviously, I feel very upset that we publish so many cartoons and saying it's a single one because we thought it was a single. And we come to the conclusion that the hydrophilic outer part is just not good enough to shield all those hydrophobic parts in the interior. And for that reason, it has to have a little bit of different than a C3 symmetrical conformation. It makes two more, so two molecules together, and then the middle part is shielded by the six groups, and then it goes like this. So that's the, the that's the, the argument. We never saw a single one except on the water-air interface. And normally, if you would have a double helix, somewhere you would see it splits off in two individual ones. We never saw it, so we thought it was a single one but it really is a double one that only can exist as a double one, like a bilayer of a surfactant. Okay, great. Okay, I think we'll stop there. That's probably all the time we have for now, but as I said, you have lots of questions and, and we'll send you those and you can follow up. Uh, but everybody, please join me again in, in thanking uh, Bert for just an absolutely fabulous talk.